Welcome to the new series. I'm going to take you on a step-by-step -step journey from having no background in electronics to understanding how a simple 8-bit computer works. Now, my teenagers are being taught how to program computers at school, but I want to teach them how computers actually work without them having to do a computer science degree. This whole project will be set at the middle high school level of knowledge, and a university degree is not required. We're going to end up with a machine that's compatible with the Apple II computer and runs Apple II software such as Pac-Man. For my regular subscribers, you might want to bring your teenagers along for the journey too. I think it's important to include both theory and practice in learning, so I've broken the journey down into three main build projects. A digital clock, an alarm clock, and an 8-bit CPU which runs 6502 machine code. You should be able to build these yourself at home, and I'll go over some of the practicalities of building on breadboard. If there's enough interest, I'll do a bonus series where we make a video circuit for the display. Each project will contain a dozen or so short videos, with only one or two learning points per video. But the concepts build upon each other until we get to a working 8-bit CPU. Here's a rough outline of where we're going in the series. We start off by going over the binary numbering system, which will be in this video. Then we'll go over simple gates, three input gates, followed by Carnot maps for complex gates. We'll then look at the seven segment display, and using Carnot maps we'll convert binary numbers into seven segment display format. Next we'll change gear and talk about latches, the SR latch, the D latch, and move on to the D type flip flop. After that, We'll look at ripple counters, then we'll make a circuit for the seconds and minutes display of the clock, and in the last video, we'll go over how we make it display hours. Now that we've gone through the plan for the series, the first thing to do is go over the binary number system. Interestingly, the single most important paper on what computers are came from British mathematician Alan Turing. His wartime efforts are portrayed in the movie The Imitation Game. If you haven't seen it, I'd highly recommend it. Remember though, it's a movie and not a documentary, so some creative license has been taken, but it's very watchable. I personally like this scene at the end of the movie, and it has a Rotten Tomato score of 90%. We'll look at this paper in more detail much, much further down the track, but it's about how we manipulate symbols to do things like arithmetic. His paper doesn't actually state what sort of symbols we should use in a computer, or even how many symbols we should have, just that there needs to be a fixed set of symbols. In mathematics, we use the Arabic numerals, 0 through 9 as the symbols to represent numbers, and the earliest computer designs were actually based on decimal numbering systems. But, the human propensity to use the decimal system probably has a biological basis and may not be a good fit for computers. Now. We English speakers are pretty familiar with Western Arabic numerals. Any number can be represented by a series of these symbols. We look at the rightmost symbol. This is the number of ones. The next digit across is the number of tens, then one hundreds, then one thousands. The weight we give each column is called the place value. In decimal, we increase it by a factor of ten every time we move left. We spend a couple of years learning this at school. If we have 5 in the 100s column, we know that the number's 500. Over time, we get a good visceral feel for these numbers, probably because we use them in every day for money. We know what $200 buys, $3,000 buys, and even what $4 million buys you. Another system for representing numbers is the Roman numeral system, which is still used often to represent time or date. There are seven alphabetic symbols to represent the numbers. I is 1, V is 5, X is 10, L is 50, C is 100, D is 500, and M is 1000. I'm not going to go over the rules behind Roman numerals. The main idea is that we're representing physical numbers with symbols. Unfortunately, there's no symbol for zero in Roman numerals, so that won't really work for modern mathematics. The numbering system that makes the most sense for computers is binary. This system was designed in the 17th century by Gottfried Leibniz. I probably mispronounced that. 
Although, more recently, there has been some controversy over who discovered it first. Each binary digit can only take on the values 0 or 1, and each digit's called a bit. Now, binary numbers are a little confusing at first, and you'll never be as comfortable with them as you are with decimal, but after a while, they do make sense. Some important things to note are, every binary number has a decimal equivalent, and every decimal number has a binary equivalent. A binary number contains as many digits as necessary, just like decimal. In general, binary numbers are three to four times longer than their decimal equivalent. Many common operations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division are done the same way, just with different rules for manipulating the digits. So, how do we represent a number in binary? Again, it's just a bunch of zeros and ones written as a long sequence. But instead of increasing each column by a factor of 10 like we do for decimal, we increase each column by a factor of 2. We can continue this as long as we need to, but for now, I'll stick with four binary digits, which we also refer to as four bits. The rightmost column is the number of ones, then the number of twos, fours, eights, and so on. Basically, we double the place value every time we move left. When we have four bits grouped together like this, it's called a nibble. Sometimes people use an alternate spelling with a Y, which I actually prefer. How do we convert a binary number back to decimal? Well, for each column, we multiply the number by the column weight and add them all together. We have 1 times 8, plus 0 times 4, plus 1 times 2, plus 0 times 1, which gives us 8 plus 2, or 10. How do we count in decimal? Well, we increase the numbers in order until we get to 9. Then, for the next number, we write a 1 in the tens column and a 0 in the ones column. When we get to 99, for the next number, we write a 1 in the hundreds column and put zeros in the tens and ones column. How do we count in binary? Well, in principle, we do the same thing in binary, but with a much more limited range of symbols. We write 0, then we write 1, but to get to the next number, we don't have a symbol for 2, so we write 1 in the 2's column and 0 in the 1's column. Next, we write 1 in the 1's column, and now we have a 1 in the 2's column and a 1 in the 1's column. What's the next number after 1-1? One, one? Well, we put a 1 in the 4's column and 0 in the 1's and 2's column. When we get to 7, we put a 1 in the 8's column and a 0 in the 4's, 2's and 1's column. I'll just fill out the rest of the table and fill in the leading zeros. If you're not familiar with binary, I'd recommend you write out this table at least 20 times over the next week or so. It's pretty easy. We just alternate 0 and 1 in the rightmost column. Then, immediately to the left, we'd write 0, 0, 1, 1 and repeat. Move left again, write 4 zeros, then 4 ones and repeat. Finally, we write 0, 8 times and 1, 8 times and we're done. So, why do we use binary if it's new and a little bit uncomfortable? From a practical perspective, computers are essentially just large networks of switches, and switches can either be on or off. Now, there is more organisation to how these switches are connected, which is what we'll be going over in the next 10 videos, but the most fundamental element of a switch, whether it's implemented with a transistor, a relay, or some mechanical device, is that switches are either on or off. I can use four switches to represent a nibble, hence I can code any number from 0 to 15 with four switches. Here I've connected each switch to a battery in a lamp, which essentially makes this four torches, and I can count through the numbers. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. I just want to show you the counting here, and I'll go over this circuit in more detail in the next video. We're nearly done, but just before we finish, I need to go over how we name the states of a switch. I'll frequently use all of these terms in the series. We have off and on, which are binary states but sometimes we call them 0 and 1, 
logical zero and logical one, low and high, and even zero volts and five volts. On my logic probe, zero is green and red is one, so I sometimes use this convention too. But off, zero, logical zero, low, and zero volts all mean the same thing and are in one group. The opposite group contains on, one, logical one, high, and five volts. Unfortunately, you're just going to have to memorize this too. Anyway, that's it for this video, and I'll see you in the next video when we start to look at gates.